Being out in trance forces people to look back on my work and apply a trans narrative to it. Because I wasn't making the Matrix films as specifically trans narratives. One of the most striking things to me is the burbling undercurrent of rage that I felt in and not being able to be who I was. Yeah. Is everything in place? The green digital coding that makes up the matrix consists of a series of numbers and characters and can easily be compared to real world binary coding of ones and zeros. It's something like a binary system programming every last detail of the simulation that oppresses, controls, and deceives the human minds that are plugged into it. The Matrix is a metaphor for a multitude of things, including capitalist patriarchy that propagates fallacious notions of individual exceptionalism that simultaneously dehumanizes members of the working class, rendering them nothing more than cogs in a giant clock, or in this case, literal human batteries. People are constantly fed lies, with the very fabric of reality itself being untrustworthy. Many accept the matrix for the real world, embodying the roles and bodies assigned to them. But there are a few who feel there is something off, an incongruity between mind and body, as well as the world around them. Neo instead lives a life of constant dysphoria, under the assigned identity of Thomas A. Anderson. You have a problem with authority, Mr. Anderson. You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. Obviously, you are mistaken. Neo is given a choice to take the blue pill and return to life as Mr. Anderson, or to take the red pill and see the truth for what it is, and then, in turn, embrace the person he truly is. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. In recent years, The Matrix has frequently been called a transgender allegory, with directors Lana and Lily Wachowski even confirming this was at least to some extent by design. This idea garnered confusion and opposition by some, with them claiming that The Matrix isn't a transgender story at all. It's actually about this, or it's actually about that instead. But the film not only is, but has always been, a trans narrative. It's just not solely that. Part of this opposition may come from the fact that the directors didn't publicly come out and identify as transgender women until over a decade after the film's release. Thus, people see the notion that the film represents transness to be a retroactive declaration. Even though at the time the directors presented and at least publicly identified as the Wachowski brothers, this does not mean that they were not closeted trans women in 1999. We had, you know, the, the Matrix stuff was all like about the desire for transformation, but it was all coming from a closeted point of view. And so being closeted could mean that they both knew but kept their transness relatively private, or it could mean that they only had ideas rather than a fully formed and articulated understanding of their respective gender identities. Growing up and even well into adulthood, Many transgender people will take considerable time wrestling with accepting their true identity. To speak on metaphorical terms, one could say that despite their skepticism of their perceived reality and desire to escape, a closeted transgender person may remain plugged into the matrix of sorts, with little choice but to be passively complicit to the system that oppresses them and conform to the roles assigned to them, until they break free from their confines, if they can do this at all. Transgender people are faced with a choice. To take the blue pill is to conform to society's expectations, to live inauthentically, and to ignore the truth. In contrast, to take the red pill is to resist conformity, to live inauthentically, and to accept the truth. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. 
Some will even compare the red pill to estrogen pills. And while Neo is ultimately empowered by taking the red pill, he is also faced with further awareness of just how devastating and dehumanizing the world around him actually is. It's pretty common, maybe even stereotypical, for transgender people to also be politically engaged in left-leaning thought. This is often a result of skepticism about the existing political systems that do not fully account for their needs. Ignorance is bliss. Unfortunately for some, it's easier to live inauthentically and to reject the truth, reject class consciousness, than to see and acknowledge the suffering around them. I know what you're thinking. Because right now I'm thinking the same thing. Actually, I, I've been thinking it ever since I got here. <sighs> why, oh why, didn't I take the blue pill? In some ways, the simulation is easier to accept than reality is. But this isn't the case for everyone. While it may be an ultimately pessimistic view to see the real world as the Matrix depicts it, Neo would rather live the truth than feel a constant state of dysphoria that he experiences. I can't go back, can I? No. But if you could, would you really want to? Thus, he joins the team that he does, and through sacrifice, fights for a revolution and liberation of others. This is comparable to both a queer person joining a group, or a found family that accepts them, or even joining a political cause to advocate for the rights and protections of social minorities. To be red-pilled is to have class consciousness. And then, on an individual level, it means accepting yourself for who you are in relationship to the world, regardless of what the system has told you to be for so long. For transgender people, this is accepting their transness, thinking outside the cisnormative binary that is often ascribed to them. All of us are conscious of the fact that not only will it be Andy in my first public appearance in a long time, but it'll also be the first time that I speak publicly since my transition. Parenthetically, this is a word that is a very complicated subject for me because of its complicity in a binary gender narrative that I am not particularly comfortable with. People don't like to admit this, but trans activist dogma is all over the place and inconsistent. I've previously used terms like binary trans person to describe a typical trans woman or trans man and affirm them as indeed being members of the man and woman binary. Although some will actually argue that any trans person falls outside these traditional binary classifications that are merely intended for cisgender traditions, and therefore all transgender people are non-binary. I don't exactly subscribe to dogmatic prescriptivism, so I see a fair argument either way. But let's run with the assumption that trans people fall outside the binary, even if they're also men and women. This traditional gender binary is aligned with the literal binary coding that serves to construct the simulation within the film. If we are to read Neo as transcoded, this would make perfect sense. He is desiring escape from the way the system has been designed, just as Trinity has broken free. Fittingly, Neo is surprised to learn that Trinity is female, in contrast to her assumed male position from her online avatar. Jesus. What? I just thought, um, you were a guy. Most guys do. Showcasing a subversion of traditional patriarchal roles by casting women as action heroes, as well as hinting at trans subtext. Dodge this. Neo is also compared to three different female characters in fairy tales and fantasy. First, it is Alice by Morpheus. You're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Then Dorothy by Cypher. It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. And then visually, Snow White, or Sleeping Beauty, as Trinity acts as his Prince Charming.
With this, the Wachowskis construct a new fairy tale that hints at subversions of gender roles and identities. I guess I should also mention that the character of Switch was going to change genders between the Matrix and the real world, hence the name Switch, which truly highlights where the Wachowskis' minds were at. But this was ultimately scrapped probably to appease the studios. Although I guess you could still read the character as genderqueer or whatever, given their androgynous appearance. Neo comes to find the red pill resistance through the internet, which is a typical way in the modern age for queer people to connect to a community that accepts them when everyone else around them fails to understand. Neo isn't exactly even aware of what precisely feels off. The red pills understand, of course, and affirm his identity that he isn't even entirely ready to accept. They are also queer coded, given the way that they're addressed. As the story goes on and Neo finds himself, he begins dressing more and more like them too. Neo already was living a double life, just as many queer people tend to do, and adopts his chosen name, as trans people tend to do. In one life, you're Thomas A. Anderson, program writer for a respectable software company. The other life is lived in computers, where you go by the hacker alias Neo and are guilty of virtually every computer crime we have a law for. Neo on occasion spends time with an underground culture at nightclubs, which he seems to prefer greatly to his daily life and public view of others. Although he still stands by the wall, perhaps still too nervous to join in. Morpheus ultimately articulates Neo's existential dysphoria for him. Yes, Neo's literal dysphoria is not gender related, and by technicality, Neo and the others may not necessarily be queer, but in subtext, the film is communicating various messages, including the affirmation of transgender identity. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. In fantasy, mirrors are often used as catalysts into alternative dimensions or alternate realities. In the case of The Matrix, it's clear that there is a Lewis Carroll homage through the looking glass and all that, but there are also simultaneous levels of subtext at play too. Here we can see a stand-in for a trans experience. Trans people suffering from gender dysphoria often have a complicated relationship to their own reflection, especially prior to social and or medical transition. But here, after taking the red pill, Neo's self and reflection of self finally become one merging together, and awakening him from a long extended dream that bears no resemblance to reality as it actually is now. Am I dead? Far from it. While indeed he may have always truly been Neo, the identity of Thomas Anderson has died at this point. And from here, he undergoes a series of medical procedures to help him integrate into the real world as Neo. Do I even need to explain the connections here? There's not just one procedure that suddenly makes him Neo, as we come to know him. He already was Neo, and affirming that is an extended process, and some things about his past continue to remain. Hmm, just like trans people. Your appearance now is what we call residual self-image. It is the mental projection of your digital self. But it's not simply a matter of finding a group who loves and accepts you, and isolate yourself and escape the world you were raised in. Neo frequently reassumes a reformed version of his former likeness in the Matrix. But he returns to this binary world, guns in hand, with newfound confidence and coolness, prepared to go out and kick some ass. It takes until the end of the film until Neo fully accepts himself as the One, and unlocks his mind and power potential. Along the way, he acquires kung fu skills, and so on. The style and tone of some of these moments feels like we are witnessing a shift in genre. This is because the Wachowskis do not adhere specifically to one set of genre conventions in telling their story, as they instead argue against such boundaries. 
Lily Wachowski has compared transgender identity to genre bending, arguing there is common ground between them. I would agree insofar as genre bending and transitioning both involve resistance to conformity, a call to action against the established order, but that's pretty superficial. If a genre were particularly more male-coded or female-coded by tradition, this connection would be stronger to me. The actual argument comes from both of the Wachowski sisters' desire to operate in the realm of science fiction, and by extension, a space of imagination, as a means to express themselves in ways that were not easy at the time. As through science fiction, there are no limits to what one can do, which in turn encourages people to recognize that one should not feel obligated to conform, but instead strive to resist convention if oppressive to oneself. The two even took this idea further when they worked with Tom Tyker on Cloud Atlas, where in addition to constantly shifting back and forth between genres and time periods, actors keep switching between character roles, including swapping between different genders and racial and ethnic backgrounds, arguing to fight against prescriptivism and boundary restrictions. All boundaries are conventions, waiting to be transcended. One may transcend any convention if only one can first conceive of doing so. So it's not gender exclusive, and neither is The Matrix, which is particularly relevant given the fact that the Wachowskis are both now openly trans. Sympathy underscores the inherent tragedy of my life as a transgendered person. In this moment, fulfilling the cathartic arc of rejection to acceptance without ever interrogating the pathology of a society that refuses to acknowledge the spectrum of gender in the exact same blind way they've refused to see a spectrum of race or sexuality. Although it is noteworthy that Lily Wachowski does acknowledge that while the film is in some ways a reflection of trans issues, it wasn't necessarily an entirely conscious focus, which should also be understood when assessing the film through a transgender lens. I I don't know how present my transness was in 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 the background of my brain as we were writing it, but it it all came so, from the same sort of fire that you're that I'm talking about, and I'm glad that it has gotten out that um, you know that was the original intention, but the world wasn't quite ready of at a corporate level. The corporate world wasn't ready for it, so. There are some moments where transgender reading is more suitable than others. The interactions between Agent Smith and Neo are especially good examples, for there is an emphasis on Agent Smith referring to Neo by his dead name, Mr. Anderson. As you can see, we've had our eye on you for some time now, Mr. Anderson. In one life, you're Thomas A. Anderson. I'm going to be as forthcoming as I can be, Mr. Anderson. Oh, Mr. Anderson. And tell me, Mr. Anderson, you're going to help us, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. You hear that, Mr. Anderson? <sighs> Goodbye, Mr. Anderson. They repeatedly refer to me as he or one of the Wachowski brothers. <laughs> Sometimes using half my name, La. as an awkward bridge between identities, unable or perhaps unwilling to see me as I am, but only for the things I do. Whether bigoted, ignorant, or neglectful, it is pretty common for cisgender people to disrespectfully refer to a trans person by their dead name and dead pronouns. Smith dead names as an act of active aggression, to put Neo in his place as outlined by the Matrix, rather than allow him to live as he wishes to outside the binary system. It makes sense Agent Smith is dressed in a black suit and tie and talks with a cold and cruel authoritative voice. Establishing his character represents social order, or at least acts as an enforcer of it. 
preserving the status quo and crushing any resistance or desire to break free or wake up. He views humans, in essence, as more comparable in behavior to viruses than he does other mammals. For humans feel inclined to spread, consume, and destroy, rather than find a natural equilibrium with their environment. Smith effectively views humanity and human resistance to an established order as a sickness in need of a cure. Human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. This could be compared to transness, seen in some people's eyes as a disease, when in reality, transness is just one of many things that make a trans person human. Every one of us, every person here, every human life represents a negotiation between public and private identity. So considering what Agent Smith represents, he must keep people conforming and live in deceit. Just as transphobic policymakers fight against trans rights and make trans people conform. I hate this place. For transgender people, transitioning and affirmation of their identity tends to help them on a psychological level, while others disregard transgenderism and trans issues and insist upon conformity, to the detriment of trans people's mental health. Agent Smith denying Neo's new identity and resistance to conformity is comparable to this. He even goes so far as to literally silence him when verbally resisting compliance, and then continues to gaslight him. But we can also see expressed skepticism of Neo's identity by the Oracle, who after examination determines he is not the one. I'm not the one. Sorry, kid. In the end, though, Neo rejects her words as he knows who he is better than anyone else, which becomes affirmed in the climax of the film. In some situations, a transgender person may have loved ones who may mean well, but ultimately aren't taking the person's identity seriously enough to affirm it. This is also a problem with some doctors too, who deny trans people access to the care they seek, under the guise that they are mistaken about their identity. That's not to say that absolutely nobody could be wrong about being trans, but generally the individual is far more likely to know than anyone else, and thus they should resist conformity. This is what Neo ultimately does in the film, and it's also what Lana and Lily Wachowski did in real life. Of course, it was difficult for both of them. In the Human Rights Campaign's 2012 gala, Lana Wachowski revealed that at a pivotal point in her young life, she intended to commit suicide by standing in the way of a moving subway train. Only because a man saw her, she stopped herself. I was very used to traveling home quite late because of the theater. I know the train platform will be empty at night because it always is. I let the B train go by because I know the A train will be next and it doesn't stop. When I see the headlight, I take off my backpack and I put it on the bench. It has the note in front of it. I try not to think of anything but jumping as the train comes. Just as the platform starts to rumble, suddenly I notice someone walking down the ramp. It is a skinny older man wearing overly large 1970s square style glasses that remind me of the ones my grandma wears. He stares at me the way an animal sta the way it, he stares at me the way animals stare at each other. I don't know why he wouldn't look away. All I know is that because he didn't, I am still here. Given the sensitivity of the subject matter, I do not wish to speculate too much here. But people have drawn connections between this moment in her life and the ending fight scene of The Matrix. Agent Smith, or society if you will, holds Neo in an arm lock as he lays on the subway track. Smith says his death is inevitable as the subway approaches. That is the sound of inevitability. It is the sound of your death. He is called Mr. Anderson once more, but in a heroic moment of triumph, Neo responds to his oppressor and asserts that indeed his name is Neo. Goodbye, 
Mr. Anderson? My name... is Neo. As he proudly declares his identity, he beats a society that pressures him to make the choice to conform or to die. And if we were to compare this to Lana Wachowski's story, we can read both as a trans person fighting for their right to exist authentically, resisting social expectations, and overcoming hardship by accepting oneself for who they are. Years later, I find the courage to admit that I am transgendered and that this does not mean that I am unlovable. The individual can shield themselves from attack at the hands of their oppressor. Just about every strike they take, every shot fired, falls into predictable patterns that can be recognized and exploited. Even if some bullets strike you, eventually you'll be able to stop them in their path. Even if opposition poses an existential threat, perseverance and confidence will eventually progress to moments of individual victory. Thus, Neo embraces his identity, masters control of his powers, and best Agent Smith, defeating social obstacles by penetrating them and blowing them up from the inside. When you encounter people, whether they're racist or they're homophobic or they're transphobic, what you realize is that those people are actually more controlled by social convention than you are. In a way, once you accept who you are, you are, will always be more free than they are. There's a critical eye being cast back on Lana's and my work through the lens of our transness. This is a cool thing because uh, it's an excellent reminder that art is never static. While the ideas of identity and transformation are critical components in our work, the bedrock that all ideas rest upon is love. You hear me? I love you. Social progress in a cis-heteronormative society can only go so far. The strides that are made are met with resistance by those who fear accepting outsiders as they are. At the end of the film, the status quo of the Matrix remains relatively unchanged. And Neo remarks that while he and his friends are taken as threats to be feared, he will show the world what they do not want to see. Upsetting the order, but advocating for love and acceptance above all else. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. A world without rules and controls, without borders or boundaries. A world where anything is possible. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you. And as we see the system fail, the camera takes us between the M and the F into something beyond binary understanding. The final scene hints at a brighter future to come, albeit a naive liberal one, if we are to take this as trans assimilation into the reformed establishment. But the sequels shatter naivete, and they take us even further into this universe and flesh out relevant philosophical and sociopolitical concepts. They also engage even more with transgender identity politics, especially in the newest one, Resurrections. I decided to just focus on the first film though, since that's the one that I like the most and the one that has caused the most of an uproar from fans with respect to whether or not it contains a transgender narrative in its subtext. It has that, of course, even if the Wachowskis weren't even completely aware of it at the time. 
Inherent objection to this often stems from a socially ingrained transphobic feeling of unease at the notion that a cherished pop culture artifact is and has always been normalizing transgender people. Others just simply don't see the connection even when they try to. I am well aware that many of these narrative parallels to the trans experience can be applied to so many other different things, but the film is a reflection of something personal, and the Wachowski sisters put pieces of themselves in it. So even if it's not exclusively a trans film, it still is a trans film. That said, I don't necessarily think it's the most developed area of interest within the film, and it's certainly not the primary reading I would even apply to this film when I am watching it which is why I was at first hesitant to cover it through this lens. But the strong resistance to this reading is too often embarrassingly misinformed or obnoxiously conservative, while defense of this reading tends to be a bit too shallow for my liking. Sorry. So naturally, I felt compelled to share my thoughts and in turn, offer my viewers a choice. Take the blue pill or take the red. What if I told you I give patrons early access to videos, as well as upcoming exclusive content and other perks? Would you take the red pill then and donate to my Patreon? What if I just asked? You'll also be listed in my credits like these lovely people. Werner Saz, Claire, Devin O, Greg, Adam Young, Yaka Rajanoi, Sophie Pilbeam, Picadon, and Wolfgang. Thank you for your continuous support on my channel and for sticking around to the video's end. Let me know what you think of it in the comment section below. And if you enjoy my work, please like, subscribe, and share it around. Stay red-pilled. Bye. You know that road. You know exactly where it ends. And I know that's not where you want to be.